Now that we learned how to be a pain investigator, what can we do to make other people's lives actually better? That's what we'll talk about today. There's no better exercise for the heart than reaching down and lifting people up. John Holmes. Today, we're going to continue our conversation about the book by Joe Polish, What's In It For Them? Nine Networking Principles to Get What You Want by Helping Others Get What They Want. Again, I think this means it in a genuine way. Never be ungenuine about this. We want to help people. We want to connect with people. And this book talks a lot about that. So we talked about that initial step of how to really make connections with people. And now that we have that connection or we understand how to connect, where do we go from here? What is it we need to do to even make that better? He says, quote, to do that, we have to, quote, invest time, attention, money, and effort and energy into relationships. Now, this is going to vary based on who this person is. If this person's your customer, maybe buying them dinner isn't the appropriate way to go. But if it's a relationship in your house, a relationship with family, or someone else, you know, what you have to do or what you should do that's appropriate probably differs per person. He talks about Dr. Caldini, who talks about the persuasion book. I believe we talked about that book. But how do we collaborate, connect with people, and understand people better? And he says that in these relationships, learning how to connect with people is bringing everyone into your group. How it's about creating influence. It's about being ethical in business by actually listening to people. And when you bring someone in, you create experiences together, and that's going to be valuable. And in the book, Joe talks about even how relationships are an act of creativity. Sometimes we do have to be creative. I know we would love to think that every time we build a relationship with someone, we just look at someone and say hi. And then we listen to someone else and then they say hi. Sometimes they think that relationships are two people saying hi and you instantly bond for life. And that oftentimes is not how relationships work or how they form. Sometimes they form by very creative ways. And that's where you're going to have to investigate how to connect with people. There was a fellow who was a customer of mine at my last job and I didn't really know him very well. And I've always wanted, you know, to build a bond with him. I usually knew most everybody in the customer community. In this case, I didn't know anything about him. And so I talked to him for a little while. There wasn't much there that we have in common. We're very different people. And then he talked about how he loved to fish. I went fishing as a kid. And so I started asking, well, what kind of fish? Is it the ocean or is it in lakes? And we started talking about that and built up this bond. And every time we saw each other thereafter, he'd tell me all about the fish that he caught and new places that he went. And while fishing is not my thing, being outdoors is my thing. So I love being outdoors. And so then also he would talk about, you know, maybe a bird he saw or an animal he saw. And we we connected over that. It is artistic. You do sometimes have to think outside the box to connect with people. And I think that's the point. Are you investing energy in connecting with other people? Or the second you find out that person is really not a you kind of person, You just drop them because relationships shouldn't be this much work. But they are. And it does take work and it does take time. And I always, I don't know, feel a little sad for people when they just drop people who are not instantaneously like them. When I would see people say, hey, oh, did you talk to our new customer over there? No, not really. They seem like they don't really want to be here. So I went over there and I talked to that person and found out she's really nervous around large groups of people. You know what I did? I just went to dinner with her. We found a cafe, a small like 50s diner. And instead of these large group dinners that everyone was going to, I just had dinner one-on-one with her because she was so not used to being in large groups of people. So they will take work. It is an art. And you can think creatively, just like you think creatively about how to solve your own problems. You can think creatively about building relationships with other people, not just instantaneously pushing people away when you don't connect. He says that he's heard the phrase, time is money, but he thinks relationships is money. That's where we build relationships with each other. And that's gold, I think. You know, money and working towards money and things, fine, whatever. But when you work towards building a relationship, 
my customers, when they saw that I actually became a customer of the software that I had been working with for the last 15 years, people have been reaching out to me. So glad you're still in the community. I heard you moved on, but we still get to talk to you. And these are people that I trained. These were people who started out in their job day one. And I said, don't worry, we're going to figure this out together. People I've known forever built up a core with them. I love them. They like me. We get along. We're excited to see each other at the conferences. And so it pays off in the end because people cheer for you. And even so, when it came time for me to think, hmm, maybe this is a time for me to move on, I had places to go. I had a customer base that would have been interested in hiring me if I hadn't found a job already that I was really excited to get. But by building relationships with people, honest ones, genuine ones, it opens up avenues in your life that you just can't replace. It's, it's worth every gem. You know, it's, it, there's not a dollar amount you can put on that kind of relationship. And so building that, creating the deep relationships also makes your life richer. It's not just about money or jobs. It's about knowing that there are deep relationships there. And so he says that when you spread positivity and love, I love that kind of concept, and being there with people and asking them and investing in them, it's going to make, like I said, your relationships better. It's going to make your work better or whatever it is you're trying to do, but it's going to make your life richer for it. And then he said that you can go on and start creating, he calls the genius network, these people who are so valuable in your life, not just because they're an object to step over towards your corporate climb, but because they're people who are genuinely invested in you, just like you're genuinely invested in them. But he says there are some dangers here. First of all, you could get lost in them, you know, start doing what they say, losing track of your own goals. I mean, again, this is, could be a relationship that's not just work, but you start investing in people so much, you lose yourself. Maybe you get overcommitted or you work so much because now you have this tie to them. Maybe you are so consumed with helping other people. He says that you get disorganized. You're always saying yes. Now you're not eating. You're not sleeping. All the things can go terribly wrong. Also, he says then you might get into those situations where you get too close to the parasites, those energy vampires, and nobody's protecting you because they're awful people who are just coming after you. They are what he says are the wrong people who are being strategic and really not good for your life, not good for what you're doing. Maybe they're taking advantage of you. If you've ever had a boyfriend like I've had where someone is trying to get something from you that is a waste of your life and your energy and not worth the time, you can get into some dangers there too. So he says to watch out to make sure that you don't fall into any of these uh, traps with people because you still, again, just because you're interested, you're a pain investigator, you're not really going to turn your life over to other people. The next step is, is he wants you to figure out what needs to be solved in their life, what problem needs to be solved that you could help with. I've made mistakes in this where I thought I knew what the problem is. Like I told you, I thought that person wanted me to solve their problem when what they really wanted me was to talk to their customers and explain what went wrong. He also says then when you're thinking about relationships and you're thinking about building your own relationships, you want to think about who are the people you love the most and why? You know, one of the things I love are people who are honest. I don't like dishonest people in my life and I won't stand for it. I also like people who are independent, people who are doers, people who like action. That really entices me. And then people who have interest in things. They read interesting books. They see interesting movies. They go interesting places. They have interesting perspectives. And so as you start learning about yourself more, then you'll be able to learn about how to build those strong connections with other people. It'll help you do that. And then he says that once you start learning about people, start thinking about what you could do to ease their pain. I was looking at some articles when I started my new job. I hadn't been in a new job in 15 years. And I started thinking, what should a person starting a new job really do? So I thought, let's just find out. And so I looked at articles and it said, 
Find out what your boss's number one hatred is on the job and then go do that thing for them. That's pretty interesting because in a sense, people are different. Like I said, the guy who knew tech but didn't know insurance. In my case, when I talked on my interview, I love technology. I love being invested in technology. I love showing people how great technology is. And then when I asked her what kind of person she was looking in this job when I was being interviewed, she said, that, that's what I want. And I knew this was a perfect job because the thing that she wanted to get rid of, the technology aspect of it, because while she's in tech, she doesn't love it as much as I do. I do. And now we're great counterparts in that. So sometimes when you can figure out how to solve someone else's pain, it actually ends up being the thing you love doing. And now that's when things go really right. And then he says, you always should be the person who answers the phone. And think about who is always worth answering the phone to. There are places, like I said, in support. I'm having this trouble where I can't get anyone to help me. My server is not set up correctly. I'm trying to figure this out. I'm trying to get this stuff moved. No one will move my stuff. Oftentimes, I had people, and namely salespeople, not help me. And maybe they were helping me in the background, but they weren't emailing me and telling me they were helping me. Come on, man, answer my email. Why are you not answering my email? And then I had other people who were like, you know what? I know exactly what's going on here. Let's work on this together. It was just, you know, pluses and minuses in that product support world. And you want that person who's going to answer the phone. And you want to be the person who answers the phone because in the end, customer support, making connections with other people, building relationships with other people, it's all the same skill. So don't just think about it. Well, I hate my job and I hate my customers. I'm not going to do that. This is about every relationship you have. You be the kind of person that you wish would be on your side. And so when I think of support and the fact nobody answered my tickets, Nobody would answer my situations. No one would ever get to my work. No one would ever do the thing I've asked them to do or even get back to me or answer the phone. That's where this is saying, be the person who answers the phone. Because wouldn't you want someone to answer the phone call when you're looking for help? Be that person. It's just like with my employee. I helped him with his insurance after I ribbed him a little bit. Because he was looking for help and was nervous about this insurance form. And I wanted him to see that there are times when he needs help, that he should offer that same kind of help to other people. And so once we know what we talked about in the last podcast about knowing people, understanding their pain, understanding their atmospheric condition and what's going on with them and what it is they really want, then we're going to answer the phone. Good days, bad days, they're mad, they're happy. We're going to be that person who connects with them and is there for them, whatever is on the other side of that phone call or email or anything else. You're going to be that person who takes the ticket. You're going to be the person when you see this person who kind of causes you problems in life calling you on your phone. Take the call. Be that person who takes the call. And he said, the point is, is that it's not just that you're going to have to be more patient with people that you don't particularly relate to. In some cases, people are great. You built a relationship with them. You love them. They love you. Sometimes we talk to people we don't love and we don't get along with. But we're going to understand, again, instead of turning people into heroes and villains, we're going to understand what it means, what they need what it means for them to get the help that they want and putting energy in that, even if it's someone we don't connect with necessarily. It's easy to do support and it's easier to have customer service when you're dealing with someone you like, but you still need to help the people that you really don't like. He says that we need to hone our people picker skills, which means that when we're trying to build a rapport to people, we have to be better at picking people to do that with. We don't want to do it with everyone. Obviously, I just said, We have to help people we don't have a great relationship with. But that doesn't mean that we're going to build that deep relationship with everybody. We're going to pick and we're going to do a better job of picking relationships. So we don't get those energy vampires. We don't get those people who just want to push our buttons. We don't get the angry people who are just trying to make us look bad. We're going to do better at that. And then he says, we have to be useful. That means we're going to help people, not just in they're there. Sorry this happened to you, 
but in actual ways. Again, I couldn't help my customer get the thing she wanted to get in the software. Instead, I gave her help by talking to her staff. It was hard for me. I mean, I'm not saying that it's easy. I've been in difficult conversations with customers. I flew all the way out to a customer site and have someone say, well, you look like a nice lady and you flew all this way to talk to us, but I'm telling you right now, I'm not doing it. Oh, okay. But you know what? We talked to each other. We listened to each other, understood why it is she said such a thing. And even though we weren't able to see eye to eye on most things, she understood at least by the end where I was coming from. I was actually speaking for her company. And then I understood in her company, the people who were the leaders in that room, understood where she was coming from. And so while we didn't get a solution that day, we, we started working towards one and it eventually worked out. Sometimes you're going to work with people you don't build a bond with, but either way, be useful to them, solve problems. And the only way you get there is by knowing what their problems are, being aware of what they need and want, and asking great questions, actually listening to them. You want to empathize with them, but don't go like so overboard they know you're fake. And figure out solutions that are something they can actually do. You want to offer solutions that meet whatever needs they're having, not just some sort of guidebooks in support. Oh, if they say A, you say B. That's not customer support. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. You're going to have to buy a new computer. I'm like, okay, we can't say that. This is back when I worked in, you know, other support days when I was in lower levels of support. You can't just tell someone, oh, by the way, go spend a couple thousand dollars on a new computer. There are other solutions out there that you can find for them. And that's what I think he's trying to say is go that extra distance to think about the real problem and not just sort of read something off of some menu of solutions. So my challenge to you is find one person that maybe you're a little bit distanced with. Maybe they're at work. Maybe it's in a club or something you do and see if you can figure out by being a pain detective by checking the atmospheric conditions, what makes that person tick, and then start appreciating them, understanding them, and figuring out how you could be useful to them. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. Please remember to leave a review, subscribe to the podcast, and tell a friend. I am trying to grow the community so that eventually we're going to have more things involved in this podcast. But again, you can always email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. You can find me on YouTube and on Twitter, and those links are in the show notes. And remember, our ability to make people feel appreciated, even those who are a bit unlovable, starts with small steps. 